Welcome to uh, Feminist Question Time today. Um, uh, this is brought to you by Women's Human Rights Campaign. It's an international feminist organization that promotes women's rights. The main aim is on defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. You can find more information on our website, womensdeclaration.com, where you will find our declaration on women's sex-based rights which has been signed by 15,442 people from 129 countries and is supported by 314 organizations. We're gonna start off with Leisha from Ireland, who is the founder and spokesperson of The Countess Didn't Fight For This. And we're going to hear about her organization, which has signed the Declaration on Sex-Based Rights um, and what you're doing. So what is your organization, Leisha? Um, hello. Firstly, I want to say thank you so much for having us um, take part in your International Women's Day event. Um, we are incredibly proud to be official signatories to the Women's Declaration on Sex-Based Rights, and we are um, in huge admiration. Uh, we have huge admiration for your work, um, so very many thanks. Um, the Countess Didn't Fight For Us is a voluntary, non-partisan um, human rights and advocacy group um, we operate in Ireland, though we have members abroad, um, diaspora and um, people who have just taken an interest in what's happening on the ground in Ireland. Um, we, um, we were founded, I founded the Countess um, a year ago, and like many of us here today, possibly we had many, many Zoom meetings um, privately before we launched five months ago um, at the end of September. And... I can't believe sometimes it was only five months ago because it feels like five years. Um, um, Leisha, what was it that made you found the organisation and, and also what, who's the Countess? What did she fight for? Well, the Countess is a figure in Irish history. Um, she was an extraordinary woman. She, um, I feel very strongly, I mean, that she transgressed every single barrier of class, race and sex in her lifetime, her life was extraordinarily um, episodic. So she was born in great um, privilege and luxury as a, a member of the arist aristocracy, um, the ascendancy we call it in Ireland, which was the ruling class. Um, and she grew up in the West of Ireland and she would have had a governess and she was a great horsewoman. But then what happened to her, which I think is very um, important for, um, women doing this work is she politicized and she radicalized and she um, by the time of the 1913 um, shipyard lockouts in Dublin she was manning soup kitchens and she was um, fully politicized and then in 1916 there was a revolution in Ireland the 1916 uprising and by that stage she was a military commander and in fact she was sentenced to death by um, the British government for her part in the uprising and sent to prison. But her, her life sentence was commuted to, her her death sentence was commuted to a life sentence um, and she was released. But then she um, took part in the German plot and she was re-imprisoned. And it was from her cell in Holloway Women's Prison that she uh, fought and won um, an election in the very first government of our nascent state, the first all. And so she became the first ever female minister for state in a modern democracy. Um, and she ended up um, dying in poverty um, on the public ward of a public hospital. And she was um, denied a state funeral because that's what af often happens in countries where um, there is you know, a revolution. The, the, the dust settles and the men take charge and they seek to really erase the role that the women played in that revolution. So they tried to sort of rebrand her as a philanthropist um, and she was denied a state funeral, but the people of Dublin came out, um, almost a half a million people on the streets. So she is our inspiration for her, um, her vision of a fairer and better society and her bravery and courage. Yeah, I mean, that point about women being put back into our place, the place that the men want us to after we've helped them with the revolution, um, is it, we're in the being put back in our place moment at the moment, aren't we, unfortunately. Um, so what about your organisation? What are you doing in Ireland and internationally? What's your sort of big message? 
Well, um, our original kind of goals and aims in the first instance are um, fairly modest, I guess, um, and they are our mission statement, which is to empower the people of Ireland to discuss the Gender Recognition Act and its impact on everyday life. Uh, we feel strongly that we need to have a grown up conversation in our country about the impact on women and children. And um, we as a group center, will always center women and children. Um, but beyond that, in terms of the work we do, we are very deeply concerned about um, single sex provision, about prisons, about sport, about um, safeguarding schools, children. Um, so we are working in all of these areas specifically, and we have working groups where we are looking at um, the situation on the ground. And so, you know, just to give you sort of some background to how that happened, this happened in Ireland, and I'm sure what, what we have seen is this is happening um, all over the world in the same way. So we have the black letter law, um, in our case, the Gender Recognition Act, which codifies um, self-ID into law. Um, in our case, there is no um, gatekeeping whatsoever, whether that be legal, criminal um, or medical. Um, anyone can fill out the form and no one has ever been refused, none have been revoked. And in our case in Ireland, only this week, a third violent male has been sent down to the female estate. Um, and the two um, males before that were each in the midst of live criminal proceedings for sexual offences when their um, certificates were granted. So in Ireland, we're in a position where um, any man who wants to, even a sex offender, can simply fill out a form and be granted a gender recognition certificate. And in Ireland, um, the law actually says um, they then change their sex for all purposes. Um, and for me, that's very, very pertinent because for all purposes means it's not a legal fiction. It's actually an access all area pass to all of our spaces and places. Um, and so therefore, it actually completely reorders the very basis of society because now we have a sex class called women, including some men who identify as women. And that obviously obliterates all single, single sex provision for women and for girls. And, you know, sometimes people will um, get in touch and say, well, I'm not a feminist, but I, you know, I don't think this is fair. Or some pe sometimes people say, I'm not a feminist, but I believe in equality. And without getting into possibly a much needed conversation about structural inequality, um, I feel that, you know, the thing to remind people is that we need single sex provision in order to try to achieve equality. There's no equality without single sex provision, um, you know, and people are now, I think, waking up to things that were put into motion 20 years ago. We're now feeling the impact um, on the ground. But Lisa, uh, Lisa are you saying, uh, do you think that there's uh, sort of more support for your, well, our position now in Ireland? Are, are women and people in Ireland waking up to the problems? Yes, I think, um, so over the last six months, five different groups have formed uh, women's, women's Space, um, LGB Alliance, Radi Colleen, ourselves and Irish Women's Lobby. And so just by making that, um, by shifting the conversation, I think people feel empowered to discuss it. I mean, I've even noticed even in the last few weeks, more and more women, uh, Irish women on Twitter are using their names and using our hashtag, which is we, we will be heard. Um, and, you know, we certainly have, um, you know, rattled a few people. There was an open letter that was put out um, calling on groups like us to be disenfranchised. Um, but, you know, things like that can turn into a, a bit of an own goal because the thing to remember, I think, is that these uh, laws are deeply unpopular. And once people start discussing them, um, you quickly find that our position is not an um, extreme or fringe position. This is the position of nine out of 10 people. It's just that we need to try to explain to people you know, that and this is not about a tiny minority who seemingly live in a vacuum. It's about, you know, the, um, looking at, like we do with everything else in, in life, looking at the common good and, and the conflict of rights. So we're going to now move to Marina Terragni, who is from Italy. She's the founder of Radfem Italia and co-founder of Res Res Resistenza al Utero in Affito, which is... Um, uh, against surrogacy. So um, thank you so much for coming to chat to us, Marina, and over to 
I am a journalist and writer, feminist, and a teacher in Venice University and founder of Rotterdam Italia, that is the most important gender critical group in Italy. We work uh, uh, on many issues that we inscribe in the category of transhumanism. We think that uh, the only real alternative uh, to transhumanism is a new female root civilization. And we are working to build it. In this new civilization, uh, women come back where nature had placed them simply in the center. Uh, uh, they are no longer the eccentric. They are no more the other about which speaks Lacan. They are the main human in harmony with nature and its rhythms. Uh, this was the design of the creation. We must not think uh, female root civilization as, as a civilization which women dominate. In a female root civilization, control and domination will no longer be necessary uh, to uh, organize a, a human community because domination is a horrible invention of coward men and women aren't coward. Fear is a male attribute. So I think that we Mediterranean and South Europe, Europe feminists, as you know, we were an uh, uh, ancient matriarchal civilization before patriarchy, could uh, offer an important contribution to organize our resist resistance to transhumanist project. Uh, uh, it's was, it was absolutely necessary to start with the uh, Radfem group in Italy because in our country, young women have a great need for feminism, but they fell into the trap of non una di meno movement. Uh, non una di meno is here is a trans feminist movement. This movement, which is overrun by men and heavily influenced by LGBTQ, promotes gender politics, a particularly sex work. Uh, you you uh, potevate vedere, insomma. A uh, de demonstration on March 8, two years ago in Milan. And um, a, a, travel, uh, a transvestite prostitute gives a lesson on sex work to girls. They are very, very young girls. The intent was to show to these girls that sex work could be a great opportunity for them. This is on una di meno. Uh, many of these girls have um, understood the trap and are looking for another feminism. We are trying to propose radical feminism to them. Our, our main work topics are gender identity, particularly the new law against homotransphobia that is being discussed in Parliament. It's a law that we oppose um, precisely because it introduced the concept of gender identi identity in Italian legislation. Uh, it's like the same of Equality Act in USA. And we know uh, that, that later it may come another la law on, on self-ID, very similar to lay trans that is being discussed in Spain. We are also sensitive to the problem of trans in women's sport. Another work topic is blocked for children we would like to build a bill inspired by Kira Bell's judgment, which makes necessary to obtain authorization from the courts for any drug therapies on minors. Today in Italy, this is not necessary. It, it is a free medical choice. Unfortunately, we too are seeing an increasing number of girls asking for transition F2M. And we are in touch with many desperate mothers or girls who ask us for help because their daughters are victims of social media propaganda. 
especially TikTok and Instagram, and they want to take hormones. This front could get very hot in the next years in Italy. We fight against gender stereotypes and for free self-representation. We are in touch with some of the transitioners too, and the, trans a tran the transitioner is a member of uh, Ralfram Italia. Another front of struggle is surrogacy. I'm founder of RUA, Resistenza Luterina Fritto, is resistance to want for rent. In our country, surrogacy is a crime, but it, it is punished only if Surrogacy is realized in Italy, while it is it isn't punished as a crime if realized abroad. We support a bill that makes surrogacy punishable even if carried out abroad. And then there are many other problems for Italian women: yeah, violence, prostitution, gender pay gap, pay gap economical violence low female representation in political institution. This is a very difficult time for Italian women, especially about employment. In Italy also because of COVID, female employment is at 48%, while the European average is 62. So we also mobilize it on this front. We work in network with other Italian and international association, and we are in touch with LGB Alliance Italy too. Finally, we are so proud of our new, of, uh, our new enterprise. Just two months uh, ago, we had created an online magazine called Feminist Post. It's a very precious instrument of political work, and we believe in it so much. So I, I, I can close and uh, I love you. Uh, I'm grateful for uh, your work and for your feminism. Going to now move on to Natalia Usakova. She's the um, Women's Human Rights Campaign Country Contact for Ukraine. And she's also um, a member of Lesbian Alliance. So um, the the uh, connection is not fantastic at the moment with Natalia, so we're going to try with with her video on and um, see see if we can hear from her. But we might have to turn the video off. So, um, Natalia, how, can you tell us about how what's happening in Ukraine and about Lesbian Alliance? What your work is at the moment? Uh, hello, my name is Natasha Usachova. I'm uh, one of uh, Women Human Rights Campaign Country Contact for Ukraine. I'm also founder of Lesbian Alliance and uh, Lesbian Oriented Feminist uh, Digital Platform, uh, which is called uh, Lesbian Portal. Uh, the idea to organize and unite lesbian community uh, came to my mind a long time ago. Uh, you know, lesbians uh, are separated and uh, don't have much connection between each other. Uh, there is also a lack of visibility and uh, positive representation. Lesbians and other women in popular mainstream uh, media. Uh, my main goal is to increase uh, lesbian visibility. It's very important. Also about uh, safe spaces. Uh, for women, girls, lesbians in particular. Um, I face a backlash from some of LGBTQ activists and their supporters. Uh, they promote inclusivity and uh, they accuse me of being uh, intolerant, of bigotry, um, transphobia, uh, because I attempted to create a lesbian only space, lesbian only group, and uh, publication dedicated specifically to lesbian women. Um, there is not much information about lesbians that you can find in Ukrainian newspapers, magazines, television, online outlets. Uh, and even if you find some information, it's usually neutral terms, or sometimes you can feel some kind of prejudice um, and negative attitude 
there were some attempts from LGBT organizations um, to create uh, some magazines and online platform, uh, but uh, they're um, mostly male dominated and uh, they're all about uh, men. So gay men, trans, uh, queers, um, their allies. Um, uh, but visibility is important uh, and representation, especially positive representation. Uh, most of Ukrainian lesbians uh, close it and uh, they just don't want to talk about it publicly. Uh, they don't want to go uh, openly about being a lesbian. Uh, so that's why I created I created this platform uh, by lesbians, about lesbians and for lesbians. Uh, first of all, to provide uh, visibility, um, information, support um, for lesbians, especially, especially young lesbians, um, to show them positive, uh, inspirational uh, role models, uh, to make them feel more secure and confident about themselves. Um, to make them feel um, they're not alone. Um, you know, there are lots of lesbians around the world, thousands and millions, uh, but unfortunately, we don't have uh, such strong communication connection uh, with each other. Uh, I think um, the main problem uh, within the lesbian community in Ukraine uh, is a lack of uh, solidarity, you know, unity, support for each other. Um, even those, um, many of those who identify as LGBT, queer, allies, uh, even those um, who identify as lesbians, uh, they often share and um, express um, sexist, misogynistic, lesbophobic, sometimes um, yeah, um, as um, the same as majority of population. Um, especially young young lesbians, uh, they learn about um, all these um, uh, sexist perceptions about women, girls, lesbians, um, since birth, from childhood, uh, from parents, from people around them, from society, and then later from LGBT organizations, social media, uh, that promote all these uh, sexist perceptions and stereotypes, negative stereotypes, gender identity. Uh, they see it, uh, they hear it all the time and they repeat it. Uh, so that's why my main focus uh, right now is to eliminate uh, the sexist perceptions of women, girls, lesbians, and to increase um, uh, lesbian visibility in the most positive way as it possible. Uh, what about gender identity in Ukraine? Um, these views of these ideas is not very popular. Um, there is currently no legislation uh, that allows a um, person um, uh, to be legally legally recognized as a person of the opposite sex without sex resentment or um, you know, these views uh, to homosexuality, it comes uh, from the Soviet Union times. Uh, when homosexuality was criminal offense and was punishable by law. Uh, Ukraine is one of the um, uh, former Soviet republics. Um, they were atheist uh, ideology, um, so that wasn't motivated by religious views, and that was um, motivated politically at all. Uh, so that was propaganda promotion of traditional families. Um, union of men and women that had to um, create families and provide um, uh, new communist babies to the world. So that was the only politically correct way to live. Um, and these homosexuals uh, were persecuted um, or considered as uh, mentally ill, as social elements. Um, Outlaws. Um, they were subjected um, to harsh uh, psychiatric treatment. Um, homosexuals could go to prison if someone found out uh, they were gay or lesbian. Uh, there was, was also approved option um, 
approved by the government uh, to change sex. Uh, so to fit uh, into heterosexual norms, uh, standards. So that was an um, attempt to erase homosexuality. Yeah, in the early 90s, um, uh, Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, so uh, Ukraine and other post-Soviet countries uh, decriminalized homosexuality. Uh, so it's legal in Ukraine uh, to be homosexual, um, same-sex relationships and lesbian relationships. Uh, it's not against law, uh, but actually we still have uh, a long way to go because uh, same-sex marriage is, is not recognized in Ukraine yet. Um, uh, so, um, I guess um, uh, there are still um, attitudes, you know, um, negative attitudes, society from people toward homosexuality uh, still in Ukraine and other parts of the other countries. Uh, so, uh, we have a lot to do. I guess, first of all, um, we have to focus on visibility and representation. Right, we're going to move on now. We're going to move across the Atlantic to the United States of America, right across to um, uh, the California. We're going to hear from Anne Manashe from Feminists in Struggle, who is a one of the first groups that signed the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights to hear what they are up to in the United States. Over to you, Anne. So this is our little logo with a fist. Uh, and our uh, acronym is FIST, Feminists in Struggle. And our slogan is our bodies, our spaces, our sex-based rights. We have t-shirts, I'm wearing one that says that. We have a banner that says that, and that's our slogan. Let's see if I can get it to move now, ha. Huh. Okay, who are we? We are a national US-based, female-only, radical feminist network. We're democratically run by our members and we're composed of individuals born female and affiliated female-only feminist organizations. We aim to bring women together from diverse radical and revolutionary feminist traditions. We welcome a whole diverse group of, of feminists and we are committed to organizing a serious fight back against the attacks on our rights from multiple quarters. We are a collection of radical feminists who see the need to join together in the defense of the rights of all women to speak her truth in a clear voice and to connect with other like-minded women towards the goal of achieving true equality and liberation. So I'm gonna talk about our birthing. We will be two years old as of, uh, we're toddlers really, but we're, <laughs> we're gonna be two years old as of March 8th, International Women's Day. That's when we launched two years ago. I, it started with a little vision that I had of creating a multi-issue grassroots democratically run organization with a thoroughly progressive um, politics uh, and a building a radical feminist movement to challenge the patriarchy. Uh, it was my belief and is my belief that women in the United States have two enemies, not one. We have transgender activism, transgender ideology and the Christian right. So from the beginning, my idea was to have an organization that rejected alliances with the far right, uh, which, which means practically speaking that um, messaging and money would be independent. Sometimes positions do overlap to some degree, but we keep our messaging and money independent and separate. So I started with this idea in my head, attended this incredibly inspiring radical feminist women in media conference in 2018 in Chicago with almost a hundred uh, women there. Uh, and, I, and I had a little clipboard and started getting names. Um, I gathered like 30 to 50 names um, of women who were interested in participating in, in forming a new radical feminist organizations. So uh, our group um, of 30 to, 30 to 40 women um, spent many months on working uh, together to come up with principles that would unite us. And uh, after this long process, because writing in a group is really hard, <laughs> um, um, of many months, we were able to launch on March 8th, 2019, International Women's Day. So uh, sorry for the small print, but I was trying to fit all our principles on one screen. Um, 
Uh, we have 13 principles we're united on. Uh, we affirm that women are oppressed based on our sex. Uh, we fight for all females um, and not just the privileged few. And, and we oppose uh, not just male supremacy, but white supremacy and class hierarchy. We are gender role abolitionists. Um, we demand, demand an end to all forms of discrimination and harassment based on sex, including addressing the wage gap, um, de facto job segregation. And an important issue to us is to pass the Equal Rights Amendment in the United States. We fight to end racism and the system of white supremacy that oppress women of color. We struggle against all forms of male violence. Uh, we work for the abolition of prostitution uh, and pornography, and we do support the Nordic model. We support complete sovereignty over our bodies and reproduction, including free unimpeded access to safe legal abortion. Uh, and we demand a fundamental right to female only spaces, programs, and organizations that are necessary for us to collectively risk our, risk, resist our oppression um, against serious challenges by forces within the transgender movement. We call for free childcare, paid parental leave. We demand an end to discrimination and stigma against lesbians. And we reject any alliances or collaboration with the male supremacist religious white right or the white supremacist anti-immigrant right. And we also, uh, because we care about the planet, we recognize the existential threat that the climate crisis uh, poses to humanity and the risk of nuclear war. And uh, even though our, cent our central focus is organizing around women, we uh, are concerned about those kinds of issues as well. So what have we done in the last two years? Our signature, signature piece that we created, uh, a group of myself and two other lawyers in FIST, created the uh, Feminist Amendments to the Equality Act, which was an attempt uh, to uh, amend the Equality Act, rewrite it actually in a big way, so that the sex-based rights of women to female-only spaces and programs uh, are preserved, while the good parts of the uh, law that extended uh, gay and lesbian rights would also um, be included. So uh, we uh, are actually pushing that right now. Uh, we have work, uh, moving down to coalitions. We established um, the Coalition for the Feminist Amendments with the LGB Alliance USA, the new newly born LGB Alliance. Uh, we formed a coalition and we are fighting uh, to um, oppose, to demand that the uh, Equality Act be amended and to incorporate uh, the feminist amendments or ideas from the feminist amendments so that women's rights are not uh, sacrificed uh, in this bill. We have um, actually uh, a year ago, we were gonna have our first national conference and, that's co and then COVID hit. We didn't know what to do with all those speakers. <laughs> And I started learning how to use Zoom. So we launched a feminist forum series and we've had a number of uh, forums uh, with uh, between you know, 20 and 150 uh, women participating. We've had forums on the Equal Rights Amendment, on abortion rights, on women's sports, uh, one on the Vancouver Rape Relief um, and their uh, right to have, be female only. Uh, and we had a big uh, forum with 150 women um, and men attending uh, regarding the feminist amendments to the Equality Act. Uh, this is uh, when we marched together on January of 2020. And there you can see our wonderful ba uh, banner. We do recruit and please contact us. Sisterhood is powerful. We are now going to Nada Paratovic from Switzerland. And she is from the Center for Civil Courage from Croatia. So um, she'll... Uh, explain if necessary uh, uh, how the Switzerland and Croatia thing link up. <laughs> Over to you, Nada. First, thank you for inviting us. Uh, I'm now living in Switzerland, but I'm talking uh, about the uh, Center for Civil Courage. This is a humanist and feminist organization established in 2011 in Croatia. I'm the founder of it. It is a uh, uh, feminist and we can say non-religious organization we are fighting also for uh, humanist values our new news project was uh, uh, la la launched uh, on 28th of october uh, in september in 2020 and it is called brave sisters what we are facing in croatia we are facing in croatia a catholic reconquista 
from uh, from um, the beginning of the 90s uh, after the Croatian independence, uh, the Catholic Church starts to 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 fight against women's rights. What we did, we we launched this project Brave Sisters, uh, and it is a project uh, to uh, where we will mm, gather and make a network of women who will uh, help guide uh, and protect women who want to do an abortion. We thought about it uh, uh, like uh, we thought that this could uh, help women in this uh, very hard time because the stigma is very uh, big uh, in, in Croatia. I want to explain to you what is the situation in Croatia, what, why, why, why we need a Brave Sister project. First of all, as I said to you, Croatia suffers from a chronic abs absence of compulsory scientific based sex education, and it leaves more or less the sex education to the Catholic Church in the religion classes. And we know Catholic Church opposes condoms and other contraceptive, promotes unscientific ideas about the harmfulness of abortion. Uh, unfortunately, the state does not act against it or against some uh, pharmacists and doctors who refuse to give contraceptive to women. Uh, while at the same time, what we see in Croatia is the growing poverty among women. So also on the social media, there is uh, such a stigma against abortion. Uh, women who ask for information about abortion, they are opposed or exposed to the uh, toxic rage of abortion, abortion opponents. We have also, as I said to you, an anti-abortion movement in Croatia that is uh, getting stronger and stronger. Uh, for example, now there are 40 days of uh, prayer uh, in front of hospitals, how it started in 2014. They pray in front of hospitals. Uh, also, uh, they organized March for Lives. Uh, it is very interesting to see that in these March for Lives are also convicted war criminals who are walking and, and uh, talking about uh, the sanctuary of life, or, or this is re really... Uh, here are... Uh, for example, also some pages when a woman wants to have to, to uh, find information on the internet. First, what she will find is this so-called abortion clinics pages. You think on the first thing because it is called clinic for abortion come on on in Croatian on Croatian language, and you think okay, this is a. Uh, uh, scientifically uh, based uh, page, but you will see that it, it is not. It is a, a page uh, from the opponents of the abortion. And then here uh, the uh, women can read something about the post-abortive syndrome and, and about, I don't know, how many women uh, have uh, cancer because of abortion and really, uh, unscientific stuff like this. This is very problemat problematic. What is the biggest obstacle? What is the biggest obstacle in Croatia is the exercising in, for, the, uh, for the women in their right to, uh, to, to, to abortion is the so-called consensus objection in the gyne gynecological profession. It, it is allowed from 2003 and I can say now from 320 specialists, doctors, something like 60% of them in, we are talking about 27 clinic uh, public hospitals where, where across uh, Croatia, where it is um, allowed to make abortion. So uh, from 322 of them, 186 refused to conduct uh, abortion. And this is main problem that we have, that women don't know where to go and what to do. And so they are forced 
to 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 go to private clinics, even private apartments, or uh, abroad to Slovenia. And uh, they are often when they are uh, um, in the hospital, the doctors often su suggest to them to not do an abortion. Uh, they give them uh, other uh, solutions uh, how on how to help them raising a future child. We have 130 women who applied for this project. And what is for me the, the most important thing is that these are women who maybe didn't, who aren't activists, who weren't activists till now, who maybe even have a little bit, uh, I don't know, they don't know all the feminists, uh, uh, feminist uh, 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 theory. But they are uh, they are now ready to 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 act and to be part of this project and this is this is what I I am so uh, delighted. <laughs> We're going now to Raka, who's representing Japan from Anti Pornography and Prostitution Research Group. Uh, first, I'd like to explain about my organization brief briefly, and next, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, explain the situation, current situation of the transgenderism in Japan, and. Uh, uh, next, I'd like to talk about uh, how pornography is uh, accepted um, uh, as, an, as a pop culture in Japan. And uh, lastly, I'd like to also explain, if I have time, uh, about, about those uh, big IT companies in Japan and related companies. Um, first, I'd like to uh, explain about my organization, uh, APP, Anti-Pornography and Prostitution Research Group. Um, it was founded in 1999. And... Uh, 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 we mainly do public research on education on problems relating to the sex industry in Japan from a feminist perspective. And uh, this group has been very small, but uh, and uh, even so, after the a Great East uh, earthquake in Japan uh, in two, 2011. So currently, we are mainly uh, uh, doing the publishing of a, a journal uh, yearly or biannually. And also uh, we are making comments on Twitters. And uh, okay, and we are also um, uh, communicating with uh, uh, feminist group with uh, other countries, Australia, from Australia and uh, Korea, uh, South Korea. Um, uh, uh, you, you, um, Caroline Noma, she already uh, um, uh, spoke in this webinar, I believe. And uh, we, uh, we are making a group of, uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, sp um, uh, introducing the idea of uh, abolitionism uh, or Nordic model in, Jap in Japan. And we are a group is called uh, ASEN. It's a mixture of uh, members uh, from APP and PAPS and BAURAK. This BAURAK is a, a uh, mainly uh, tackling issue with comfort women problem. And the PAPS, um, they're, uh, they're providing support to the uh, survivors of pornography uh, industry. And, uh, and next, I'd like to explain about the current issue, uh, the, uh, transgendering, uh, trans transgenderism. Um, we realized about the, the harm of this transgenderism uh, probably around uh, about two to three years ago, but uh, uh, um, most of the people in Japan don't uh, don't know much uh, anything about uh, this transgenderism. Uh, they only think it's it's the um, uh, it's a normal um, human rights issue. Uh, like uh, lesbian and gay issues, but the um, and they they don't know that it could oppress um, women's human rights. So um, so we are mainly uh, speaking about uh, uh, about this uh, possible harms on uh, on Twitter, and uh, we a uh, member of APP uh, is uh, translating the uh, articles. Uh, from uh, of uh, abroad, and uh, uh, we are putting up on our websites. And uh, 
currently um, Jap uh, Japan's leading um, Japan's leading party is the uh, Liberal Demo Democrat Party, and uh, uh, it's very conservative um, to the level of, uh, of miso misogynic. And so they, but they are also not friendly to LGBT. So currently, uh, uh, they don't. Uh, they have. They seem to have no intention to introduce any LGBT friendly laws. But the op um, opposition parties, such as uh, uh, Communist Party or uh, Constitutional Democrat parties, uh, they uh, they are aware of these LGBT issues, and uh, uh, they are they are um, they are uh, they are making the uh, group uh, a working working group uh, to uh, to tackle these uh, LGBT issues, and they created a, a bill. Um, and I believe they already submitted it, but uh, and uh, and they said uh, uh, discriminations uh, discriminations based on uh, gender should be uh, prohibited. But the the problem is uh, this: there's no uh, clear definition of gender or what is uh, considered as discrimination uh, on on this bill. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, ex uh, I'd like to explain briefly about the uh, situation of pornography in Japan. Well, Japan is highly developed capitalized country where local women's social, economic, and political status is very low, and feminist or women's movement are weak. Uh, porn culture has been dominated in post-war Japan, and its pornographic items or its digital contents have been exported in vast quantity into or downloaded in many countries. Japanese pornographic manga animation, which is called hentai, are uh, consumed worldwide. And uh, uh, as, as you already know, um, uh, the one of the largest uh, porn website, a porn hub, was uh, uh, had, uh, remo removed uh, most of the contents last year, December. and. Uh, Quite a lot of uh, uh, pornography created in Japan was uploaded on the website, including uh, those, uh, including child porn. Um, and also, Pornhub uh, published a, a, a yearly access uh, on their websites. And according to the report, um, Japanese user is. Uh, uh, most searched term in 2019 was Japanese on the on porn, uh, porn hub and also uh, most viewed category was uh, hentai uh, those uh, uh, anim animation and manga uh, manga style pornography uh, main it's mainly feature uh, child porn or rape or incest or something like that we're going to now move on to Alika Keenan, she's from Argentina, uh, founder of the Alika Keenan Foundation. Over to you, Alika. My name is Alika Keenan from Argentina. I'm a survivor of the crime of human trafficking for sexual exploitation. I'm an abolitionist activist. For me, it's really an honor to have been called to present my organization among all of you. Really, thanks for that. We work in the investigation and interpretation of the crime of human trafficking. This work is, the, is in the University San Martin in Buenos Aires and Alika Keenan Foundation to improve, investigate the process and the development of public policies in the legislative sphere and their application in those who execute them. Our organization brings together professionals like a team from various areas in order to address the complexity and integrity of the crime, promoting prevention and collaborating for the restitution of victim rights, providing legal, psychological and social assistance during the judicial process and contributing to the academic production. My main objective is to empower women 
who have been victims of sexual exploitation to find against to pimping and pimp lobby around the world. Abolitionist is radical feminist, feminist, sorry. Abolitionist is human rights woman. This is our big battle as survivor, as women, uh, and as feminists. Thank you very much for that. Now going to go to Amy Sousa and Courtney Piper. They're in the United States and they're organizers of the March on DC. So they're going to give us some information on that. Over to you, Amy and Courtney. We are organizing an event called Women Picket DC to protest Biden's executive order on gender identity. Um, we are founding members of the organization, which has just started since February 1st. And um, I would like to also introduce Kara Dansky, who is another organizing member. Also, she is the WHRC country contact. And I wanna just uh, have her talk a little bit about the EO. Our Women Picket DC event was frankly inspired by President Joe Biden. Uh, as many of you know, on January 20th, he issued an executive order that will essentially erase women and girls in federal administrative law in the US. And the day after he signed that order, I was feeling very disheartened and I phoned my good friend Courtney, who's going to be speaking with us today. And we were talking and in the course of our conversation, all of a sudden an image popped into my head of the suffragists standing outside the White House holding a sign that said, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? And I thought, Courtney, we need to do this. We have the exact same question today that the women had 100 years ago. Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? So Courtney took the idea and ran with it, and she's going to tell you how we've gotten this done. Um, I want to go on to just also say that in terms of the executive order, WHRC USA is working so hard. We have so many women working so hard to write letters to various federal agencies to explain to the heads of agencies why the replacement of sex to mean gender identity in the law is dangerous and harmful to women and girls. We are, we are doing this now. Uh, President Biden gave us essentially until April 30th to explain to these agencies why what he has done is so harmful to women and girls, and we are doing our best. I also just want to say very briefly on the topic of the Equality Act, which is separate. That's a bill pending before Congress. Uh, the, the Senate Majority Leader is a man named Charles, Schum uh, Charles Schumer, and he could bring up the Equality Act for a vote at any time, and we're hoping he doesn't do that. And so many of you saw an email from Joe requesting women to sign on to a letter to his staff. And I really wanna thank the almost 700 women who have signed that from all over the world. Uh, we need to tell our Senate Majority Leader why passing the Equality Act would harm not only US women, but women all over the world. So thank you so much to all the women who have already signed it. If you haven't, please sign it. I just want you to know, this is not a request to sign a petition that's going into the void. We have a direct contact with someone in his office. We need to tell him what this is going to do to women and girls all over the world. And with that, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, WHRC. Back to Amy. Okay. Uh, thanks, Kara. So I want to I want to share with everyone uh, some of the wins and successes that we have had as an event and as an organization. Uh, and I really just want to. Uh, hopefully inspire people because this started just one month ago uh, with, with four organizing members. So it was four of us and now it has grown. Um, we are a delegation of over 50 members. Uh, we started simply with our own passion and our energy around this and it has just been exponential with women coming on and on. We're incredibly passionate about our um, values and those, those values are simply that women and girls are fully embodied, whole human beings. And there are no special categories of men or boys that somehow deserve our single sex rights to privacy, safety, and fairness based on our sex and our bodies. Um, so our event has been incredibly contagious. Um, we have 50 delegates in all kinds of states. We have 13 partnerships um, with feminist organizations here domestically and internationally. This includes um, WHRC USA was our very first endorser and partner in this. So we've been so thankful for and grateful for that. Um, 
we have had all kinds of media that we have garnered, um, including uh, Kara did a fantastic interview with Tucker Carlson on Fox News, which is a national media spot. After that spot that Kara did, that's over 3 million viewers. Um, she plugged the WHRC and it actually shut down uh, the WHRC website because of how many views it garnered um, for that. So we had so many signatories that were developed because of that spot. We've also had um, spots with Graham Linehan, uh, Kelly J. Keene, these are both international UK, um, Free Birth Society, which also again was 3 million viewers. So we have people that have been um, now seeking us out and trying to develop relationships with us um, for our protests and for our event. Um, we've spoken with Benjamin Boyce, um, so many people. Uh, we just, we know that what is happening right now is that women have, are just thirsty for opportunities to um, share their passion and to um, to have a concrete place to put their uh, righteous rage and and um, all right, so I'm going to now introduce uh, Courtney Piper, who is our director of Women Pick at DC. Um, she's going to tell you a little bit about how we accomplish these goals. Uh, thank you for having me. So we're really proud, like Amy said, of what we've accomplished in about 30 days. We're almost at $30,000 in our fundraiser. We use the Give Butter uh, format for that. Uh, we have had issues in the past with organizations working with other fundraising sites. So I want to tell you about the, the nuts and bolts of how we did this, because our goal is to essentially share this information and give it as a formatting if you're now just starting an organization or if you want to develop your organization. So first and foremost, the foundation of your organization is so important. You need to pull in women who are gender critical, who are visible, who are motivated, who have the time. Who are polished in their skill sets already. They don't have to be perfect professionals, but they have to be polished in their skill sets or and be willing to learn and have the time to do these things very, very quickly. It's a fast moving river when you're doing a short fundraiser in a, in a short amount of time. So we've had that. We've pulled in our foundational members and we have a lot of diversity on our team. It's very important to have an audience where you include women from all sections of society, socioeconomically and um, ethnically. Um, so we have women of color who are represented on our board and in our advisory. We have um, taken a lot of time to craft our own optics and our visualizations. And I wanted to show you some of our marketing strategies from the very beginning. So in the United States and like most places around the world, the, um, some of the feminist communities can be uh, very divided in some ways. And so our goal was to create to create um, a coalition that reflected first and foremost, scented mothers and their children. Because when we get into that optic, we want to make sure that we're representing all of humanity and centering like other women have also mentioned, mothers and the environment. It's essential that we make that connection to radical feminism and radical environmentalism. It's one in the same, okay? It's essential that you have women in your foundation that represent all women. Like I said, making sure that you're tapping into all those target markets. So with our visual, and I believe we can't pull it up, that's okay. Go to our website and you'll be able to see our poster that we created, um, womenpicketdc.org. I wanna show you a couple of pieces of our marketing. We did a sweatshirt here. It says, the word woman is taken. That's one of our taglines. It was a nod to what Posey had done um, across the pond. This is our own branding. And then we have a separate one that's a little more unisex. Okay. And um, so we did, we carefully crafted that messaging and the visualization of representing uh, mothers in this movement. Let's see. I want to touch on a couple of things. Let's see. Oh, fundraising is extremely important. So we have a team member, Sam Berg is a team member of ours. She has extensive experience in fundraising. Um, so it's really important to make sure that you're doing a ton of outreach there, that you're um, thanking your endorsers, that you're thanking your contributors. 
um, and that you have a staff dedicated to that because women are fueled in this movement. They are seeking places to put their money, especially mothers who cannot be visible in this movement because of you know, the connection to their children and all of that. So people are willing to give right now and they're giving and it's very important to thank them and have strategies around all of that. Just in the last five minutes, we've had 50 new signatures on the Schumer letter. So again, thank you so much. Joe, and please, please live stream us and, and watch the event, be a, be a part of it. We've got Bernadette O'Malley, who's the UK country contact from um, for Women's Human Rights Campaign. And she's going to give a little bit of information about what's is ha what is happening from here on the um, International Women's Day? We had the idea that uh, to kind of hijack the official um, International Women's Day uh, Twitter um, hashtag. So this uh, on the left hand side there, you'll you'll see, well on one side you'll see it's very uh, professional stuff. That's what's come from their website, and on the right is me uh, doing my um, kind of. Uh, protest one. So basically the idea is to uh, tweet out, choose to challenge, do the same uh, hand sign and write on your hand what it is that you challenge. Um, and uh, so I challenge gender ideology. You can choose to challenge anything you want, anything in your language, um, put it out there. They don't own the hashtag. So let's fill it full of, um, full of us saying that as women, we choose to challenge um, and uh, gender ideology, sex stereotypes. Um, you choose your message. Um, just remember that on your hand is the thing that you hate. Don't put uh, WHRC or something like that because this is what you challenge, okay? Um, I'll be doing it. Uh, if you don't wanna do it out of your own Twitter account, I'll open the DMs of the, um, the UK one um, and you can just send me your picture and I'll, I'll tweet it out from there. Um, otherwise, um, yeah. Let's fill it full of us, um, choose to challenge. Thank you.